making a difference for those living with HIV and being there for them. Next. I'm a transgender woman and my dream was always to be loved and be accepted. Ask your healthcare provider if Big Tarvi is right for you and visit BigTarvi.com to view the important facts, including important warnings. Welcome to Plus Talk on Plus Life, where we're all about turning positive into a plus. Today, my guest is Jose Romero, and you may have seen him in the CNN documentary short features called Blind Angels. He appears in one of them set in uh, North Carolina. Hey, Jose, good to see you. Hey there, good to see you. I want to talk about this great uh, CNN series called Blind Angels. You are um, an activist. You're a, a, a healthcare strategist um, living with HIV there in the South. So lots to talk about. But the, the series Blind Angels, what were your initial thoughts when, when you were approached to participate in this? Well, thank you for the question. I'll admit that I didn't know what the title was going to be in advance. So uh, don't hold me accountable to that. But uh, as you mentioned, I have been living, loving, and working in the South um, for the last several years. And in fact, um, my entire experience as somebody living with HIV has been as somebody living here in Durham. Uh, and the South has something to say. The South is the new epicenter of the HIV epidemic. And depending on who you ask, it's always been the epicenter, right? Uh, and so uh, when we were first approached um, to take part in this work, what we really wanted to do was highlight highlight the fact that here in North Carolina, we are the birthplace of antiretroviral medication for so many community members um, here in the U.S. and globally. Nevertheless, we still have a long way to go to end the HIV epidemic. And what it's going to take is relationships. And so we wanted to share about our relationships here in North Carolina, my relationship to my good friend, Joaquin Carcaño, who couldn't be here today, but he actually gave me this uh, hummingbird. Um, so I feel like he's here with me in spirit. And so is Marco Castro Bujurquez, who uh, was my mentor in a lot of this HIV work that I've been uh, involved in. So the series, um, as I said, it's it's a it's sort of a number of short documentary features um, on, on CNN. What do you hope audiences walk away with um, after they watch not just yours, but the other great stories as well? Well, one thing that I would love for folks to walk away with is a desire to find a political home, to find people that you are going to organize with and to commit to building one wherever you are. Because that's what we've done here in Durham. We've built a community of people who have been showing up for each other when we don't have cars to make it to our appointment, when we're scared to go to the doctor for the first time. And in fact, in the episode, you'll see uh, Diego Lucas, uh, who works with Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement, getting their blood drawn for the third time in their life. The first couple times were much earlier in their life in their infancy. So as an adult, this was their first time getting their blood drawn on camera um, as a part of this uh, project of working together to build better health care outcomes for Latinx folks, all uh, Southerners, all people everywhere. Yeah, and I felt bad watching it because they had to stick his they had to stick their arm a couple of times um, because there was, I'm like, if you haven't had your blood drawn, like this is the third time and then they're jabbing at you. Um, yeah. You talk about, we, you talk about, you know, uh, the American South is the, is the new epicenter of the HIV pandemic. Why do you think the South, why do you think it is that this is really where HIV just is still exploding? Well, you know, it's going to depend on which community you're working with. You know, shout out to the Black AIDS Institute, to Thrive SS, Positive Women's Network, some folks who have been on this series with you talking about their work, because they are people that we need to really pay attention to um, so that we can have these blueprints um, for what actually is going on here in the South. But some of the reasons include stigma. Uh, we have the most amount of HIV criminalization laws here on the books in the South, where just by being in the presence of somebody living with HIV, people can use that as grounds to incarcerate somebody and potentially deport them, right, if they uh, aren't a citizen in this country, right? Uh, among other things, we also have transportation barriers. One of the earlier things that me and Joaquin would do was actually get a ride to our appointments together. I didn't have a car, and so if I hadn't had him around, I don't 
know how I would have been able to pick up my medication earlier on. And here in the South, we have hospital closures. People have to go farther to find their people, find their healing. And that's what we, why we really wanted to share how important relationships, relationships are for this work. Yeah, and in, in, in your particular episode, you, you guys talk about that chosen family, which, uh, it, you know, just sort of echoes what you're saying now. You also describe your activism as searching for those that you've lost as a labor of love. You talk about how many people you've lost, and that really inspires you, right? It does, because, you know, um, this work is uh, soul-wrenching work, right, to really be committed to change. And it requires sometimes engaging in conflict with people who you love, your family members, your uncle or aunt around the table who might be stigmatizing people who share your own status, and they just might not know that, right? Um, that's something that so many people living with HIV know, right? Being able to actually uh, be in principled struggle with people and say, hey, I want to take a stand and I want to love certain people and I'm willing to do it at the expense of losing those who want to harm people I love. That's no small thing. And so when I talk about my activism as being uh, searching for those who I've lost, it's not that I haven't found them, you know, I, I need to put my glasses <laughs> back on. It's that I actually think that we've been disconnected. We've been pushed apart by this stigma, by these, uh, the transportation barriers, right? Like housing, it's getting harder to find housing. You're uh, on the West Coast. Lord only knows how, how, how difficult that is, right? And all of this just translates into how we show up for each other. If you don't have a house, if you don't have food, if you're worried about getting arrested or evicted, you might be stressed. And that might make you more conflictual with people. And it might make you walk away from relationships that you need to stay healthy. And do we actually have to like each other to be able to work together, to achieve liberty, to achieve equity? I don't know. But I know that we have to be able to show up for each other. So in 2018, one in five people living with HIV identified as Latino. How do you think things have evolved or changed and how are they different today in 2022? Well, I have mentioned Positive Women's Network and I want to highlight them because uh, in particular what we see is that something that continues to haunt the HIV epidemic. And even right now, right, we're two ostensibly gay cis uh, men um, living with HIV, right? Um, the narrative continues to be one around um, uh, cis men, often cis gay men. And so women, Latina women, have been left behind. And mortality for Latina women living with HIV is one of the highest um, compared to other demographic groups. So I've been really seeing um, a lack of concern for women in the epidemic. Um, and in the series, um, folks can stay tuned and see a beautiful episode with a wonderful kindred of mine, Antoinette um, from Atlanta, who's going to be sharing about her journey, her journey building a family as somebody who's paused, because this happens, right? And it's worthwhile and beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, part of your activism um, includes being that hand to hold. Who held your hand? Whose hand did you get to hold on to when you were navigating your HIV status, getting told over the phone, being told you should probably get that sorted out? And I think you went jogging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that might not make sense, right? If you, if you see it out of context. <laughs> but um, I had this practice of hanging out with a friend of mine, um, Sarah Craig, who's a yoga instructor in uh, Philadelphia. And we just happened to be together when I got this phone call from a provider who had been stigmatizing me for admitting that I was having sex with other men. And he just told me like, hey, I think you have HIV um, and you should probably come in. And I said, I'm not able to come in. He's like, oh, well, we'll go find another doctor. And then hung up on me, um, which, <laughs> you know, that was that story. And so I was clearly distraught. And my friend Sarah Craig definitely held my hand. But it wasn't until I met um, somebody named Marco Castro Bujorquez, who I mentioned before, that I really saw myself in the movement. Um, he taught me to love hummingbirds uh, because they work so tirelessly. It almost looks like they're levitating because they're working so hard. And there are people in this movement who have been doing that tireless work and not getting that recognition. People like Awahida Shabazz, Vanita Ray, uh, Marco, Andrew Spindener, like all of these different beautiful folks who have in different ways, Barb Cardell, who recently celebrated a birthday, right? 
who have uh, Julio from Aid United, people who reach out, this community that takes care of each other. Those are people who hold my hands. I'm missing some other folks. All of the beautiful people at the Cerro Project, right? Which um, Kamaria, Tammy, you know, Kevin, all of these folks have shown up for me when I've needed them. And I think that that's why I really love to focus on chosen family, because at the end of the day, those are the folks that are going to get us through whatever we need to. Well, we are for sure glad that uh, you're out there holding hands and, and, and being chosen by people to be part of their family and taking care of each other. Jose Romero, thank you so much for your time. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see your purple. Um, and, I, I, and this will make no sense to anyone else, but I owe you some tater tots. That is going to do it for this episode of Plus Talk. If you want more information about Jose Romero and what they do and want to get involved, perhaps um, offer your services, be a friend, just check out our website, pluslifemedia.com. We'll put all the information up on there as well as Jose's social information so you can check him out. That will do it for today. Until next time, take care, wash your hands, smile, be kind, and remember you can turn positive into a plus.